So what is hypertension? Well, blood pressure varies throughout the day with activity. If you get up and do things, your blood pressure typically goes up. If you're stressed or somebody's attacking you, your blood pressure goes up. If you're relaxed, your blood pressure goes down, and that's normal. Elevated blood pressure over time is called high blood pressure or hypertension. And that's the diagnosis of chronically elevated high blood pressure. High blood pressure is dangerous because it makes the heart work too hard. You overstress the heart, and it also puts a strain on the end organs, such as the kidneys, the brain, and the eyes, as well as other things. So high blood pressure is something that we need to survey for and control because of its effects on other systems. Hypertension is very common. At least 50 million individuals in the United States have hypertension, probably more, and approximately a billion worldwide. Um, most people with high blood pressure have really no signs or symptoms. You've probably heard the terminology, the silent killer. You don't know you have high blood pressure most of the time unless you check your blood pressure, which is what the, you know, we do obviously when you come to see the doctor or at screening fairs like this or going to the Walmart or the Walgreens and sticking your arm in the little cuff. 90 to 95% of all patients with hypertension have what we call essential primary hypertension. They just have high blood pressure for no other real cause except uh, for that. A few patients do have secondary hypertension, and we'll cover that briefly. Um, that's something your doctor needs to be aware of if you have clues that target you to go look for other causes that might need to be tri treated specifically. So what symptoms do you have? Well, we just said most people are very asymptomatic. It's the silent killer, and if the reason we say that is because many people show up with a heart attack, a stroke, congestive heart failure, only to find out their blood pressure is high and probably has been for many years. If you have extremely elevated blood pressure, you may have some symptoms that present that may want you to go get checked specifically. These are severe headaches, severe anxiety, shortness of breath, or nosebleeds. If you have chest pain, you're having a heart attack, if you have sudden weakness or numbness on one side of your body or stroke-like symptoms, obviously those are all things to do that. Obviously, if you've ever been to a paramedic or called EMS, the, one of the first things they're gonna do is check your blood pressure, because that can tell a lot. It's a so-called vital sign. So just don't wait till you have these to check your blood pressure, but if you have these, you certainly need to check your blood pressure. So who's at risk of high blood pressure? Most people. Um, it is a disease uh, that's worse as you get older. The older you are, the more likely you are to have high blood pressure. Unfortunately, African Americans are at increased risk. They tend to have higher blood pressure um, and a higher incidence of hypertension that needs treatment than Caucasians or Mediterraneans. Family history, if your mother and father and brother and sister and every cousin in your family has high blood pressure, the odds are you do too. These are so-called non-modifiable risk factors. There's not a whole lot you can do about that except be aware of it and get screened for it. But there are a lot of modifiable risk factors that put you at risk. Being overweight increases your risk of high blood pressure significantly. A sedentary lifestyle increases your risk, just the lack of aerobic exercise. In addition, it puts you at risk of being overweight. Smoking is a huge risk factor. It acutely increases your blood pressure just by smoking a cigarette right then, but also damages the artery walls and increases the arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries that can lead to high blood pressure. Too much salt intake or sodium, go have a bunch of salty chips and uh, a margarita with salt on it and your blood pressure is gonna go up. Drinking alcohol, not one drink a day, but more regular, uh, greater than moderate use alcohol can increase your blood pressure uh, chronically. Stress or anxiety, we see that all the time. Highly stressed out people, uh, whether it be uh, things at, at, at home or at the job, or acute stress such as being scared or frightened will increase your blood pressure. And then chronic medical conditions, high cholesterol, diabetes, kidney disease, sleep apnea, as well as some others that we'll talk about. These not only put you at risk of high blood pressure, but they make some of the effects of the high blood pressure put you at higher risk of cardiovascular events and need to be uh, treated more aggressively. So we'll talk briefly about obesity. Uh, you'll hear a term called the body mass index or BMI, okay? We, we normally uh, weigh you when you come in, get a height, 
we can from that calculate a BMI. That's now the best number they recommend using for screening. Uh, it's not a perfect system. Obviously, uh, you know, some of the players on the LSU football team may be heavier for their height than is recommended. Uh, you know, so body fat percentage and things like that are important. But it is important to know your BMI <coughs> for most people. People are, uh, the World Health Organization defines being overweight as a BMI greater than 25. So if you're six foot tall and a male, that means anything over 185 pounds, you're overweight. Obese, anything over 225 pounds. So you've probably seen people or know people who six foot tall, 225 pounds, and they may or may not look obese, but for the generic population in large groups, that's the weights we're talking about. So certainly the heavier you are, the worse it is. It is a, a continuum relationship. But just because your neighbor weighs more than you doesn't mean you're not overweight. The problem with being uh, overweight is you have excess adipose tissue. This revs up the renin-angiotensin system as well as other hormones, causes you to directly increase arterial tone as well as causes you to hold on to sodium and water. All these together make your blood pressure go up. The other thing that makes it go up if you're morbidly obese is obviously if you're 285 pounds rather than 185 pounds, you walking from here to there is much more work or strain on the heart. That drives your blood pressure up. So why do we care about high blood pressure? Mainly because of the effects it has on other systems. As a cardiologist, we see it all the time on what your heart risk is. There is a direct, continuous, consistent, and independent relationship on cardiovascular events and high blood pressure. Individuals whose blood pressure is elevated, and we'll go over the definitions in a little bit, greater than 140 over 90 are at increased risk of serious cardiovascular events. Okay? People who present for treatment of their first stroke or first heart attack or congestive heart failure, almost universally, two-thirds to three-fourths have high blood pressure, defined as greater than 140 over 90. So it doesn't mean controlling your blood pressure is going to prevent everything. But if your blood pressure is high, we're much more likely to see you in the ER having a heart attack or stroke. And it's something that we can treat and hopefully decrease that. So this is a somewhat busy slide, but this is the definitions from the uh, Joint National Council 7 on what is high blood pressure. We hear this all the time. People, through the years, the definitions have changed slightly as we've learned more, as we've gotten more aggressive in treating high blood pressure. And so it's important to know what numbers you need to know. Normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, okay? Hypertension is greater than 140 over 90, and that's what we call stage one hypertension. In between, they've come up with a, what we call pre-hypertension, meaning we don't need to treat it necessarily. We need to address your risk factors, lose weight, watch sodium intake, but you don't necessarily need medicines once you get to a diagnosis of hypertension, you almost always need some form of medication. And then stage two hypertension, more extreme hypertension needs uh, treatment up front and almost always needs at least two medicines to treat you. So that's greater than 160 over 100. So we talk about these two numbers. Whichever one puts you in the highest category is the one you're determined. So you may only be 142, but if you're 105, then that means you're stage two hypertension, and that's important. There's a lot of debate out here. You'll hear people, which number is more important? Well, they're both important. There's no clear benefit of one over the other. Um, you also hear in older patients, there used to be what we call systolic hypertension of the elderly, where the top number was higher, but the bottom number was well controlled, and many people would not treat those. Um, the information says that they still do worse than controlling the blood pressure, Part of that has to do with how it's recorded and is it an accurate blood pressure. And sometimes in older patients, it's a little more difficult to get. Uh, but, but be aware of these numbers. Every time you go to a health fair to get, donate blood, go get checked at your local doctor. Know what your blood pressure was and keep it below here or get it treated. Just for reference, this is the, the sixth Joint National Conference back in 1997. The numbers were still similar. They just used different te te uh, terminology. They called normal less than 130 over 85, but then they used optimal for less than 130 over 80. 
Also, they had this high normal range rather than pre-hypertension. They called it high normal. And the numbers here were the same except they had a stage three. Now what they decided, these two are both at increased, significantly increased risk and so they merged them together. So as you see numbers float around, that's where they come from. Just so you're aware, there is a eighth Joint National Council recommendation probably coming out within a year or so. And some of these may change slightly, but the, the word on the street is probably not. So how do we diagnose blood pressure? Well, we gotta measure it. Um, make sure you have an appropriate size cuff put on the upper arm uh, <clears throat> and uh, placed firmly but not too tight. We then blow it up until you get a reading. And then when you hear the sound, you march it down. The top number is when you start hearing the sound, the bottom number when the sound goes away. They also have electronic cuffs, which do that somewhat automatically for you. Um, certainly, uh, blood pressure can change, like we said, with stress and anxiety. So you see that you come into the office, first time you check it, it's a little high. We recheck it a few minutes later, it's a little low. Um, you want consistent readings. You want to you ideally have been sitting for a few minutes. Um, so sometimes, you know, you're late for the appointment, they rush you in, they do an EKG, do another test, throw you in there, check it real quick. It may be a little higher than it runs on a normal basis. But if you're checking this in a chronic setting, you want to sit, feet flat on the ground, relaxed with your arm, somewhat level on a tabletop, and have it checked. If elevated, then you want to repeat it. You want to wait for a minute, try to repeat it again, make sure these are consistent numbers. We're all, we can only act based on the numbers we get, but they do, the more accurate they are, the better. Um, the ones at the pharmacies or uh, the electronic cuffs and so forth, most of them are fairly accurate um, in the sense of uh, they will get a repeatable number most of the time. Your machine may be slightly off, so if there's any question of that, we recommend just bring your machine in when you go to the doctor. They can check it with their manual cuff. You check yours there, and if it's five points off, at least you know it's five points off. You can calibrate them or just know, hey, mine runs five points higher than what I get when I go to the doctor. So <clears throat> we have to be aware of hypertension in order to control hypertension. It's the leading reason for office visits to physicians in the United States because it's so common. Um, this is some older data from the 90s, but this is over 16,000 patients with hypertension. 32% of those were unaware that they had high blood pressure. 15% were aware, but did not receive treatment. And of those receiving treatment, 26% uh, percent were uncontrolled. Here they used 140 over 80 in this study. So if you take all that together over all these patients, only 27% of these patients with known hypertension were actually controlled. So not only do we have to know you have it, we then have to treat you and we have to follow it up to where we know it's controlled in order to decrease your risk. This is some newer data from early 2000, but puts it in a graphic form. All the patients with hypertension by different age categories, as you can see, if you're older, much more likely to have high blood pressure not aware of it, untreated, uncontrolled, and this small population here are people who were treated and controlled for their hypertension. We want this graph to look very much like this graph to decrease risk down the road. So it's good that you know about it, but you gotta take the medicine and follow up to make sure it's controlled. So what is the recommended screening? <clears throat> Typically, they recommend now uh, for adults starting at age 20. Obviously, pediatrics still check, and there is some concern about a growing epidemic of high blood pressure in children, especially with obesity. Um, you have a blood pressure screen at each regular healthcare visit or once every two years if your blood pressure is optimal when you have it checked. Now, we say or every two years, as you know, especially middle aged men. Sometimes they say they have no medical problems because they haven't been to the doctor in 5, 10, 15 years. So if you don't go to the doctor, then at least go get it screened somewhere. Go to the fire department if it's next door to your house. Go to Walmart and stick your arm in the cuff and know what those numbers are. If your numbers are high, then, it, then go and get it looked into. Ideally, everyone should be getting a basic medical exam at least every two years. Even if it's normal when you check it when you're 40 or 55, you still have a significant increased risk of developing hypertension at some point in your life. 
So as you get older, that's your biggest risk factor. You still have to check it. So just because you checked it, you know, when you turned 50 and did, a, uh, and did a physical at work, doesn't mean at 55 it may not be high. So how do we evaluate? The first thing is to screen. We have to know the number, okay? Just because it's normal one day doesn't mean it's always there, but the more you check it periodically, uh, uh, the more likely we're, we are to find it. If you find that you have high blood pressure, then we want to do a basic evaluation for end organ damage, or has it already done something to the kidneys, the eyes, the heart. Assess for possible secondary causes. Like we said, that's fairly rare, but in certain patients, there are clues that will drive you towards that. And then control the blood pressure, and we'll talk about that at length. These are some of the tests that your doctor may do when he, uh, when he first diagnoses hypertension. <clears throat> They'll check, uh, potentially check a blood count, check a urinalysis. We're looking for protein, blood, or glucose, indicating that you've started to have some kidney damage due to the elevated blood pressure. As I explained to people, it's like blowing a, <clears throat> uh, a fire hose at your kidney. If it's high blood pressure, it's seen these high pressures over and over and over, and it takes a toll on the kidneys and other parts of the body. So that's why you have to control it. Um, check potassium, creatinine, blood glucose. You're checking lipids and others to look for other potential things such as diabetes and high cholesterol, which increase your cardiovascular risk. And likely we'll do an electrocardiogram or an EKG to assess for uh, evidence for thickened heart muscle or what we call left ventricular hypertrophy. The heart is a muscle. So if it pushes against elevated blood pressure over and over and over, you'll get it just like if you did curls and trying to build up a bicep. It will thicken the heart muscle. People with thickened heart muscle due to high blood pressure are at higher risk of stroke and congestive heart failure. This is kind of a busy slide, but it talks about essential hypertension versus all these other causes of hypertension. So as you can see across different studies, about 90 to 94% have plain old high blood pressure with no other cause. About 5% have chronic kidney disease, and these often go hand in hand. The chronic kidney disease is rarely a cause of the hypertension, but often people with long-standing hypertension have chronic kidney disease. If you go to the dialysis center, just about everybody there has long-standing high blood pressure. There are a few other causes that we potentially need to look into uh, depending on what clues show up. So if people get what we call resistant hypertension, meaning we just can't get their blood pressure down, then we look at things like improper blood pressure measurement. Maybe the cuff is the wrong size. You put a cuff that's too small for someone's larger arm. You blow it up, blow it up, blow it up. It takes higher pressure to occlude the artery to make the heart sound. So if your cuff is too small, it will make your blood pressure seem like it is higher than it is. Counter to that, a blood pressure cuff that's too large on a small skinny arm will make your blood pressure seem normal when it may be a little bit high. Um, excess sodium or salt intake, uh, chronic kidney disease, um, in a non-adherence, meaning you're just not taking your medicines, inadequate doses, obviously the stimulants such as cocaine or other over-the-counter decongestants can drive up your blood pressure. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, Chronic regular use of this will increase your blood pressure, also puts you at risk of chronic kidney disease. Not that you can't use them, but just be aware of that. If you have high blood pressure or kidney trouble, you need to be careful. Um, Over-the-counter supplements and then some of the things we discussed, excessive alcohol or obesity. So secondary hypertension. What are some of the things your doctor may want to go investigate in you particularly rather than just give you the medicine? The big one that is growing is sleep apnea. This is where you, at night, you tend to pause your breathing, you hold on to it, it causes pressures in your heart to go high, can lead to high blood pressure. Drug-induced or related causes, which we talked about, kidney disease, and then some of these renovascular aldosteronism and so forth. Thyroid's another one. If you're hyperthyroid, then that can drive your blood pressure up. So not that you need to memorize all these, but just be aware of some of the things that we think about um, people with sleep apnea are typically obese ma males, often described as being heavy snorers. Not everyone who snores has sleep apnea, but it's something that makes us think of that. Uh, chronic kidney disease, people with abnormal protein or blood in their urine. Um, people with renovascular hypertension, that's where they tend to get vascular blockage to the arteries to their kidneys. If they have blockage to their carotid arteries or to their heart arteries, they tend to be at risk of this. 
There's some evidence that if we improve the blood flow to the kidneys, it can help, but typically does not cure their hypertension. Um, primary aldosteronism, Cushing's uh, pheochromocytoma, and we'll talk about a couple of these briefly. These are just a few things to, from the textbook to look at if your potassium levels are out, if your kidney function is abnormal. Um, based on those initial screening blood work, then it may trigger them to go look further. So renovascular hypertension, that's a fancy term for, uh, which includes renal artery stenosis. That's blockage with fatty plaques to the arteries of your kidneys. Your kidneys are the regulator of blood pressure. So if they don't get enough blood flow, then they're telling the brain, hey, your blood pressure is too low. So they send signals out to increase hormones, hold on to more fluid, and increase the arterial tone to try to drive the blood pressure up when in fact the rest of the blood pressure is seeing too much blood pressure and so it's a vicious cycle that you have to break. Um, most of this is just atherosclerotic plaques, same people who have coronary disease, carotid disease, peripheral arterial disease. In young women we see fibromuscular dysplasia more often. <clears throat> that doesn't mean everyone with high blood pressure needs to go be checked for this. Most people with hypertension are fine. They, but if you have the, the combination of renal dysfunction or abnormal kidney function, other type vascular disease and hypertension, then it makes you more likely to want to go investigate that as a cause because if you can improve that, it may preserve kidney function and allow you to better control your blood pressure. CPAP for sleep apnea. So if you, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone went to the sleep apnea lecture, but uh, obviously, that's uh, determined through clinical history as well as a sleep study to assess for this. And sometimes it's fairly dramatic. Um, sometimes through the history, we can piece it together pretty well. If we take someone who is hypertensive, not bad, 142 over 91, and they have sleep apnea, and we put them on a CPAP, we can drop their blood pressure almost uh, 7 and 10 points uh, just by treating their sleep apnea. Now, as we said, one of the biggest risk factors for sleep apnea is obesity. So if you lose weight, it may help the sleep apnea. It may also help the blood pressure directly, um, and that's really the first-line agent. But certainly treating, you know, as I tell people, treating with CPAP, which is the machine that blows and helps you uh, from pausing your breathing at night, is beneficial. Obviously, if you can lose weight and the sleep apnea improves, then you can get off of that. <coughs> so... How do we treat high blood pressure? Well, we recommend you maintain a healthy weight, which we talked about. Be moderately physically active on most days of the week. We recommend 30 to 40 minutes of aerobic exercise at least four to five days per week. That doesn't have to be out training for a triathlon. That means get your heart rate up uh, uh, for 20 to 30 minutes, leave it there, and let it come down, whether that be on a treadmill, whether that be uh, walking around your block, whether that be rowing or something. You know, we hear all the time, well, I'm active at work. I, I go, you know, to and from the job site or whatever. That's certainly beneficial, but you want to get sustained aerobic exercise for 30 to 40 minutes a day. Um, certainly you can work that into work and so forth if you need to, but just getting up and running to their desk and back 20 times a day doesn't do the same thing. Following a healthy diet plan, one that's recommended is the DASH diet, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit, but really limiting sodium can help. If you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. One, maybe two drinks a day, uh, not much more than that, otherwise your blood pressure starts to take a toll. And if you have high blood pressure and you're on medications, take your medications. Unlike certain medications where, oh, I forgot this this day, I forgot my vitamin today, it's not a big deal. We're lowering your blood pressure with these medicines. If you take it for two days, don't take it for a day. Your blood pressure is up and down, up and down. Okay? It's not something that we're curing. <clears throat> Any hypertensive therapy has been associated with reductions in cardiovascular events by 35-40% uh, decreased risk in stroke, 25% risk of uh, myocardial infarction, and over 50% of heart failure can be decreased if we control blood pressure. It's estimated that if we take someone with stage one hypertension, that's mildly elevated, let's say 150 over 95, <clears throat> and one additional risk factor for cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, a family history, smoking, and we treat them, lower their blood pressure by 12 millimeters of mercury 
over the course of 10 years, we can present one death for every 11 in here. So look around the room. We could prevent some of you from dying if we knew your blood pressure was high and treated it. <clears throat> These are some of the, uh, some of the causes of, uh, of secondary hypertension, primary hyperaldosteronism, second leading cause of hypertension. Increased risk of aldosterone secretion makes you hold on to fluid. Uh, we go and uh, get an adrenal adenoma or adrenal hyperplasia. They may want to look for other tests. About it. I think some of these slides are out of order now. But. Obstructive sleep apnea, we talked about clearly associated with elevated blood pressure, and uh, you need to treat that. 50% of patients with sleep apnea will have hypertension and 30% of patients with hypertension will have some degree of sleep apnea. So lifestyle modifications. This is the start of every treatment plan. Um, some of them are easy to do. Some of them are much harder. Um, you may need medications on top of this, but certainly this helps. Weight reduction. We talked about a BMI of less than 25. If you can lose 10 kilograms, now that's 20 pounds, so we're not talking about you know slimming down a little bit. You can lower your systolic blood pressure from anywhere from five to 20 points, okay? So if you're six foot 225 and you can get down to six foot 185, you can maybe not have to take medicine for your blood pressure. The DASH diet, rich in fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, and, uh, and this is a particular diet put out by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which we'll show you in a little bit, about 10 millimeters of mercury difference. Decrease in sodium reduction. The typical American diet is sometimes in excess of six to eight grams of sodium a day. If you can cut that back to more like four, you will do some major improvement. Regular activity, almost 10 millimeters, and decrease in your alcohol to no more than two drinks. This is the DASH diet. If uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute website, you can go read all about it if you, you know, get on the internet. There are 50 million different diets you can look at, but this is one that was studied in a large study by them specifically for control of hypertension. Now, there are other diets out there for weight control. Weight is a huge factor in high blood pressure. Ideal protein diet, South Beach diet, Mediterranean diet. Um, there's a new one all over the website now. Uh, Bill Clinton went on Dean Ornish's diet. Um, and all of that can lower blood pressure mainly because it controls your weight. But this one is a balanced approach of vegetables and fruits, grains, low-fat dairy, just a few sweets or cut that off the top altogether. You can eat meat, on, but it's typically leaner cuts of meat and in moderation. So this is the algorithm for treatment of hypertension. It's kind of busy, but uh, this is you know, kind of what's recommended that your doctors will be reading. Lifestyle modifications, that's where we start. Okay, no matter what you do, if you need medicines or not, you still need to address some of the other issues. Um, we typically start medical therapy if they're at 140 over 90. But if you have other diseases such as diabetes or heart disease, we sometimes use a lower goal. So you may be on high blood pressure medicine even if your blood pressure wasn't all the way over that. Um, initial drug choice is, uh, fortunately now we have many different drugs to choose from. So there's a lot of rhyme or reason why you pick one or the other. Some is physician preference, some is side effects. A lot of it has to do with what your other conditions are because there's some that may benefit. For instance, if you have prostate enlargement, an alpha blocker may help with that while also improving your blood pressure. If you have uh, diabetes, then an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is typically beneficial to help protect the kidneys, so we may use that first line. But most uh, people will require two blood pressure medications to control it if their blood pressure was greater than 160 over 100 to start. And nowadays there's a much bigger push to go lower dose of two drugs rather than high dose of one. Um, and so sometimes start those up front. These are some of the medical conditions that we talk about. So heart failure, people with congestive heart failure are often on a diuretic to control their fluid, beta blockers, an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, people who've had a heart attack need a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor, even if their blood pressure is relatively controlled, so we'll give them those up front. Uh, people with diabetes, 
ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are found to dramatically uh, decrease the risk of end-stage kidney disease, which is one of the harmful effects of diabetes and high blood pressure, uh, and recurrent stroke, people with diuretics as well as ACE inhibitors. So fortunately, there are a lot of choices out there now. We're going to go through a few of these classes of medicines just to familiarize yourself with them. Um, you know, obviously, the, some people are, are more prone to side effects of certain ones. Some people's kidney function may mean we can or can't use a certain drug. But just be familiar with the names so that you'll know what you're on. I always recommend that patients have a medication list that's accurate and up to date. Ideally, even put out to the side of it what you're taking each medicine for, whether it be for blood pressure, cholesterol, prostate, or so forth. That way, if things are changed, you'll know. If you, if you know the type drug you're on, if, uh, put that on there as well. Sometimes we'll see in the office people end up changing from one ACE inhibitor to another, but never stopping it. So they're actually on two of the same type medicine. Um, and, you know, that's uh, duplicative and certainly doesn't help them. Uh, and with trying to refine medications, if you know what you're taking and why, then it tends to be a little easier to keep track of them when they're changing. So ACE inhibitors or angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, they work through the kidney system blocking this particular enzyme and that helps regulate the arterial tone of the kidneys and that's how it regulates your blood pressure. In about 5 to 10 percent of patients you will get a dry irritating cough. It can be annoying but it's not harmful but if you get it you certainly should mention it to your doctor because there are other options. Very rarely can cause angioedema which is where you swell up almost like an allergic reaction. And if so, it should be stopped immediately and typically not tried because it can be life-threatening if undetected. It does work through the kidney, so you have to monitor kidney function as well as potassium levels. So typically, if you go on an ACE inhibitor, you would get a blood test in a month, uh, two to four weeks after to check that. These are some common names. Um, you're probably familiar with them. If you look at the theme here, if they end in PRIL under the generic name, that means that they're an ACE inhibitor typically. Um, trade names, that means that's what the company named it and sold it as. Once it goes generic, this is what the pharmacy sells it as. It's very difficult to keep track sometimes, so always be familiar with what the two different names are. Um, you know, you get people sometimes, I've been on Prinaville for years, I don't want to take Lysenopril, it's really the same, but be familiar with what they are. It's hard for us to keep track, and certainly for you, you it is, um, but just be aware of that. <clears throat> the good news here is Almost all of these are now generic, so ACE inhibitors have gotten to where they're fairly inexpensive and they're fairly uh, uh, effective, and so it can you know, lower the cost on some of that, and certainly the insurance companies are pushing use of that. Angiotensin receptor blockers, these work by a very similar mechanism, but they bypass one of the tracks that causes that little cough due to increased bradykinin levels. So if you take an ACE inhibitor, get a dry, irritating cough, and have to stop it, you'll normally then go to an angiotensin receptor blocker as an alternative. <clears throat> so still work through the kidneys, still affect potassium, so you need to monitor all of that. There's also good data that angiotensin receptor blockers help decrease the risk of kidney dysfunction from diabetes. So everyone with diabetes or congestive heart failure should be on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker unless you have some contraindication to that. These are some names of here. So this is the generic name or the so-called chemical name in the far right corner. Uh, this is the only one thus far that has gone generic. The rest of these are trade names. That's why we get calls from the insurance company all the time. Can't you switch them? Can't you switch them? Um, certainly that's, that's a possibility. Like I said, a lot of times if you go with one over the other, it's because of uh, side effects or uh, potentially effectiveness in the sense of uh, Valsartan has some good data in heart failure patients or diabetics. Um, but the good news is a few of these that are not generic now will be going generic in the next year or two, and so it'll be back to a somewhat level playing field. This is uh, another slide just combining the two together and looking at doses. The one thing I tell patients is be, realize that, uh, you know, candesartan is 8 to 32 milligrams, Valsartan is 80 to 320 milligrams. Every drug is a little different. So if you switch from one to the other, it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. 10 milligrams of one drug doesn't mean 10 milligrams of another drug. Beta blockers. Uh, these block receptors to lessen the effects of catecholamines, the so-called epinephrine or adrenaline of the body. 
Um, it works on the heart as well as the blood vessels. It decreases the heart rate, decreases the overall heart contraction, and thereby decreases the blood pressure. Um, some people, it'll, uh, certain medications also work in the lungs, so if you have severe asthma or lung disease, it can cause a little bit worsening of that, so we have to be careful. Um, also in men, uh, some people, especially if you're prone to it, will worsen erectile dysfunction. And so typically for straight high blood pressure, we don't tend to give this to young men because of that problem. So, but if you've had a heart attack or you have congestive heart failure, they're highly beneficial, and so we typically will give it um, unless you have lifestyle-altering side effects. These are a few of the ones listed. Um, propranolol here is very, very old, often not used for hypertension anymore, but sometimes you may be on it for tremors or some other reason, but it can work on that. Uh, atenolol, been around forever, works pretty good for high blood pressure as well as other problems. Atenolol and metoprolol or low pressure are probably your most common ones that you'll see. If you have congestive heart failure, carvedilol or Coreg and Toprol XL or the extended release metoprolol are the ones that are most indicated for heart failure and so that may be there. As you see here, these are actually two different drugs that are used slightly differently because of how we give them. One is metoprolol tartrate, one is metoprolol succinate or extended release. Please try to know which one that is when you check with the pharmacy because nowadays, now that they've both gone generic, they often get swapped up and uh, that can cause your blood pressure. One of them only lasts for, for about half the day, the other one will last the whole day. So if you go back and forth, it'll cause swings in blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers, this is the third big class of medicines. Uh, so you have the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, the beta blockers, and now the calcium channel blockers. These work directly on the blood vessels to help relax the muscle. The muscles have calcium in them. You block that, it causes them to relax. Um, some of them, the non dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers, can slow the heart rate. The most common ones there are diltiazem or verapamil. Also, uh, diltiazem used to be called cartazam. Um, they work, often work better on African Americans as well as older patients because they tend to have more high vascular resistance, which it relaxes. Um, but they're probably as good as ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. The issue there is they don't work, they don't work through the kidney. So if you already have kidney dysfunction, which makes the ACE inhibitors difficult to use, calcium channel blockers can be highly effective. <clears throat> These are some of the ones we talked about, diltiazem, verapamil, and then the one strictly for blood pressure that you'll see a lot is amlodipine or Norvasc. Um, some people get some lower extremity swelling or edema in their ankles and legs when they start that medicine. Some people it's fair, fairly profound and we end up having to stop it. Other people can continue on it, but it can be a little bit annoying. <coughs> Vasodilators, this is kind of a whole group of medicines. These also work directly on the muscles of the, of the arteries to relax them. Alpha blockers, frankly, many people do not use strictly for blood pressure anymore, but you may have your urologist giving you uh, Hytrin or Teresacin for prostate enlargement or Cardura. Um, they work on blood pressure. They tend to have side effects from what we call orthostatic hypotension, where when you stand up, you get dizzy or lightheaded. Uh, but if you need it for your prostate, then it might be a good addition to your other medicines. Clonidine is highly effective and very powerful. It can have some side effects of dry mouth. It can cause you to be dizzy or lightheaded. The biggest one that's a concern there is what we call rebound hypertension. It needs to be given at least tw uh, twice to sometimes three times a day. If you're taking it and then miss it, it will cause your blood pressure to spike up almost immediately and sometimes go higher than what it was before. So that's certainly, all your blood pressure medicines are important not to miss them because you don't want wide swings in your blood pressure. But this is one, if you run out of this or lose this, you need to make sure you get it refilled right away. That's not one where you can wait, oh, I'm going to see them next week and I'll get it filled then. You need to get it filled right away to get it uh, to avoid any problems. Hydralazine is another one, and minoxidil, you'll often see these in people with kidney disease because of the fact they don't work through the kidneys and they're very potent. Diuretics are so-called fluid pills. <clears throat> they're two general types, the loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics. These help decrease the overall <clears throat> volume or sodium content in the body um, and thereby decreasing blood pressure. You'll see these in people with congestive heart failure. <clears throat> Thiazide diuretics are most commonly used for hypertension. 
such as hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ or chlorothalidone. They can waste potassium levels, so you have to be careful if you take high doses that the potassium levels don't get too low. They also can work on the kidney function, so you need to monitor that as well. These are the most common ones, like I said, hydrochlorothiazide, typically in very low doses, such as 12 and a half to 25 milligrams. Um, they do have some, <clears throat> the Lasix and Bumex are the ones we typically are using in heart failure, and that's more just to get the fluid off that builds up on the lungs or in the lower extremities. Um, some people will be on spironolactone or a plerinone if they have end-stage heart failure or they have that primary aldosteronism as a cause of their hypertension. So medication compliance, we always go back to this. The medicines are effective, but unfortunately you have to take them. We don't cure hypertension by giving you a medicine. We manage hypertension. So it's very important that if you get started on your medicines, you take them. If you make lifestyle changes, lose weight, watch your diet, certainly you may can back down, but the goal should not be to come off the medicine because it's just very unlikely that you're gonna get all the way to that point and I find patients get frustrated or they get their blood pressure improved and then stop their medicine and it goes right back. Um, <clears throat> at a year out, less than 50% of patients are taking all of their medications. So to summarize what we did, and then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, hypertension is very common and often uncontrolled. We use the term, it, you're unaware or you're untreated or you're treated and uncontrolled. Lifestyle modifications can, signif can significantly decrease your risk of hypertension as well as the cardiovascular risk associated with hypertension. Control of blood pressure directly decreases cardiovascular events. So if you have high blood pressure and you treat it, your risk will be lower than someone who has high blood pressure that is not treated. <clears throat> we, we don't cure hypertension, but we manage it with medications. So take your medications. If you think you're on too much, if your blood pressure is getting too low, recheck it. And certainly we can back down on them at times, but you have to take the medications and control the blood pressure. Secondary causes of hypertension are fairly rare, but certain clinical clues might target your doctor to go look into those and therefore, if you can treat an underlying cause, then it may lower your blood pressure and allow you to be better controlled. 